Such functions, of course, include language, memory, judgment, veto powers, etc., and emotion. We discussed that in week one and two. Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's dementia is thought to affect about 24 million people worldwide. There are currently no cures for Alzheimer's disease. So one of the questions might be, okay, what, what else do we know about uh, Alzheimer's? Well, we know that acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and NMDA glutamate receptor antagonists sometimes slow the progression of the disease. And of course, this is one example where we have very clear neurological understanding, neuroscientific understanding of the problem, and yet it does not necessarily follow a complete cure. And that's precisely why this disorder, whether we want to include it only in psychiatry and psychology or in neurology as well, will have uh, to be considered from a social, philosophical, personal, emotional, and psychological perspective in order to support not just the patient as well, uh, but, but also the the family and all the, the the members involved in both the treatment and the life of the individual. Now, the, the beta amyloid play, plays an essential role, as we can see here, but it's, it's important to understand that it's much more than just a neurological disorders. So there is an element of synaptic dysfunction and neural death, but of course, uh, whether we talked about the, the neurofilary tangle, the, the, the phosphoroid tau proteins, et cetera, we have to think about the understanding of what psychology is and even what consciousness is. In this image, you find this, this stabilized microtubule. And uh, when we think about what defines who we are from the perspective of, let's say, uh, psychology of consciousness, when we think about microtubules, okay, in, in, a, in a broader sense, we can think of uh, the theories by, by um, uh, Stuart Hameroff, for instance, um, um, and, and, and the, the, the mathematical uh, modeling with uh, Roger Penrose, to give you an example. So this is one slide that investigates psychiatric disorder as well as neurological disorder, and the fact that the, the dividing line between the two is somewhat arbitrarily uh, constructed. Um, another example here, so within dementia, uh, behavioral variant frontal temporal dementia is the most common, um, and this is characterized by progressive semantic dementia, personality changes, and loss of empathy which is, of course, connected with both um, personality disorders, which we'll see uh, in a few slides, as well as the understanding of what uh, language and cognition is representing in terms of how we understand who we are as people, as persons. Um, and the interesting thing is that prototemporal dementia is sometimes associated with an increase in creativity which is also something that's interesting to consider within psychological disorder, because very often in things such as uh, bipolar disorders, uh, when we think about mania or hypomanic presentation, very often this increase in creativity in, in, in influence uh, might be misperceived as a positive factor. So again, we have to understand that uh, perception that are outside of the clinical understanding might actually be uh, to some very big extent detrimental to the way the person feels about the current situation. And another slide talks about OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And again, the question is, is there evidence for a neural correlate? Is observing something in the brain the same as saying the brain caused this issue to occur or not? In obsessive compulsive disorder, the research shows an increased activity in the circuits connecting the basal ganglia to the orbital frontal, anterior cingulate, and dorsal medial frontal cortex. The pattern of activity differs depending on the types of obsession. So something that I would like you to do at home is to see, for instance, whether other problems such as Tourette syndrome and Huntington disease could also be viewed as an intersection between psychology and psychiatry on one side and neurology and neuroscience on the other side. I always like to do that because I want to stimulate your own learning uh, of these important topics. Now, the next slide here has to do with some basic classifications. Now, this is a very brief analysis of psychological disorders. So bear in mind that this is just a way to start our conversation. Psychotic disorder. Severe psychiatric disorder characterized by hallucinations and illusions, social withdrawal, and a disconnect from reality. Mood disorder, disturbances in affect, emotions, see depression and mania, we'll see that more in depth later. Organic mental disorders, mental or emotional problems caused by brain pathology, brain injuries or diseases. 
anxiety disorders, feelings of fear, apprehension, anxiety, and distorted behavior. Let's move on to the next slide. Somatoform disorder, physical symptoms mimicking disease or injury, blindness, anesthesia, without identifiable physical cause. Personality disorder, deeply ingrained, unhealthy, maladaptive personality patterns. Dissociative disorder, temporary amnesia, multiple personality, or depersonalization, like being a dream world, feeling like a robot, feeling like you're outside of your own body. We will talk about it more in depth because this has to do with multiple personality disorders and dissociative identity disorders. Are they one and the same? It's just a question of renaming it or not. We'll see. Sexual and gender identity disorder versus disorders of sex developments, DSDs, gender dysphoria, problem with sexual identity, deviant sexual behavior or sexual adjustment. This is a very complex topic, so we will uh, discuss that more in depth in the future. But also, if you're interested, I will post the link to a specific playlist that addresses this specific area um, of psychology and medicine as well. Next slide. <clears throat> Substance-related disorders, abuse or dependence on a mind or mood-altering drug, like alcohol or cocaine. In this case, the person cannot stop using the substance and may suffer withdrawal symptoms if they do. Neurosis, once used to refer to excessive anxiety, somatophore, dissociative disorder, and elements of depressions. The next one, substance-related disorders, abuse or dependence on a minor mood-altering drug. More specifically, the individual is not able to stop using the substance and may suffer withdrawal symptoms if they do. Neurosis, again, once used to refer to excessive anxiety, somatophore, dissociative disorder, and depressive states. Now, a few things about depression here. Uh, well, one thing to keep in mind is that on one side you have nature, on the other side, side you have nurture. And those two things, of course, are mutually influencing the general picture. On the left side, you see the hospitalization per 100,000 uh, individual um, for both uh, female and male. And you can see that rates in terms of age group expressed in years. And you'll see that there are quite significant differences. I did not discuss this too much in depth, but I also want you to know that suicidality is also very different, and the modality that uh, uh, lead up to suicidal ideation, rehearsal, and um, suicide itself are also very different, uh, both in terms of statistical um, elements as well as the way they are approached uh, in comparison between male and female subject. On the right side, we're talking about the genetic makeup and the 5-HT transporter allele in red, short, short, in green, short, long, and in blue, long, long. And of course, this has to do with the probability of major depression episode and number of stressful events. You can see here lifetime incidence point and of depression in the general population, which is to say that the probability is based on our current understanding, yet again connected with genetic makeup, experiences, um, events, and uh, what we see as this resiliency uh, and stress models, uh, which is connected to some theories behind depression, biological theories, possible abnormalities with glutamate neurotransmission, uh, indication of low levels of the neural growth factor of the, the brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF, I'll I always like to quote the research by Rita Levi Montalcini uh, that um, um, helped her uh, discuss the nerve growth factor as well as, you know, in the context of the, the, the Nobel Prize research. Monoamine hypothesis of depression, possible shortage of the monoamine neurotransmitters. The expectation is that the inhibition of the enzyme monoamine oxidase, which breaks down these transmitters, should result in an improvement of mood. Another hypothesis, which is quite popular, in the psychiatric research is a serotonin hypothesis, which, of, as the name implies, has to do with the possible shortage of serotonin, and the SSRIs specifically affect serotonin levels to target depression uh, as one of the most commonly prescribed antidepressant. Uh, third slide about depression. I mentioned earlier the stress vulnerability model, the fact that the degree of psychopathology, low, medium, high, has also to do with the stress a person encounters in juxtaposition or combination with the vulnerability, what brings the person to the state of affair they find themselves in. 
So the networks of brain areas can be either underactivated or overactivated in individuals with depression. So there is, to a very big extent, a fight and flight response, which is similar to the processes that we discussed when we talked about the HPA axis, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal um, axis. Uh, and we will cover that more in depth when we'll talk about stress, but also in regard to uh, the amygdala. The subgenual uh, single cortex is consistently hyperactive, and this hyperactivity returns to normal following successful treatment of depression, based on everything we just said. Furthermore, the dorsolateral and dorsomedial prefrontal cortex tend to be less active, which is the neurological factor. But yet again, it's never only uh, biology or genetics, it is also life itself, we could say. The last slide for this brief intro to depression, uh, bipolar, which we will discuss again more in depth later on, uh, this rainbow uh, graph here indicates the top of manic episodes of full mania, followed by hypomania, hypomanic episode, in green the the we can say the normal quote-unquote mood, the baseline mood, the yeah, euthymic. You means good, preferable. Think of you um, um, rope, for instance. Uh, light blue, low mood. And finally, dark blue, major depressive episode. Individually, bipolar disorder uh, show in research uh, thinner gray matter in the bilateral, ventral, lateral, frontal cortex, bilateral, anterior, insula, dorsal, medial, prefrontal cortex, and subgenual cingulate cortex. I don't expect you to remember all these uh, uh, neurological factors and the brain areas that research indicates, but I want you to have a general understanding of the connection between, again, mind and brain or uh, psychological factors and neurological, biological factors, uh, which is to say that mental health disorders can be best understood if we think about what happens inside our bodies, also in terms of genetic and developmental factors, as well as in terms of the way we experience life itself, our stressors, our triggers, our targets, our successes, our challenges, and how things can be actually cumulative. A good example in developmental psychology or child psychology is adverse childhood experiences. Another example is how we can, uh, we can see this uh, in a, um, a lifeline perspective so that we can see problems as a cumulative sequence of traumatic events. So a good way to understand this is to compare what we usually uh, uh, see in psychology as primary factors. So in order to do that, I would like to uh, use this little piece of paper and I will actually write on the whiteboard some, some example here. There's a model that I usually call the triple D model. Um, I always like to use uh, some um, mnemonics to remember things, and uh, I'm a big fan of the number three for obvious reason. Um, so the triple D model is a shortcut to remember how things can escalate in terms of psychological disorders from more basic factors to more life-threatening factors. By life-threatening, I also mean things that can compromise the uh, normal everyday uh, life in the patient. So the triple D as the bottom, uh, the, the way we understand that is to think about distortions, distortions or automatic thoughts. Now, we did not fully uh, discuss this yet because this will be part of psychotherapeutic techniques that we uh, will encounter in the next few weeks. So for now, just think of uh, distortions as negative, usually automatic thoughts that compromise the way we interpret the world. Now, the reason we focus on the negative ones is because usually that's where most psychological issues originate, but the opposite can also be true. So for instance, uh, a distortion might be a, an automatic thought that I have that forces me to consider the fact that nobody likes me, okay? That's just a thought that pops in my mind and I think nobody likes me, okay? I might or might not have enough evidence for it, but that's what we call it, an automatic thought. And this is something that uh, to some extent occurs to every one of us, uh, but will eventually create this chain effect that will uh, corroborate our thoughts. So for instance, um, I might wake up in the morning, I don't feel really well. Uh, I already think that I don't have enough energy, 
and I don't know, I start to uh, brew some coffee or, or have some tea and then spill the tea or coffee uh, on my shirt. And this is already a confirmation of the fact that, see, this is a bad day. It's going to get worse and worse it goes. And then because I, I stay in my shirt, then I waste extra time at home to get ready. And then I'm late to uh, go to work. And then because I'm late at work, my supervisor has a few words to say. And it's another confirmation that the day is bad and on and on and on. And I am contributing, cognitively speaking, to the fact that, see, nobody likes me and the day is bad and tomorrow is going to be even worse. Okay, so this is the first level, the first D, distortion, negative automatic thoughts that uh, don't necessarily have any evidence, but might create a problem in the future. Do not worry. We'll talk about that more in depth in the next few weeks. So uh, aside from automatic thoughts or distortion, we have a step above. And under D, these are delusions, okay, which are um, a step above in a sense that they might create an even more disconnect with reality. For instance, uh, in my group of friends slash acquaintances, right, uh, the fact that everybody despises me is probably not true, but it could be true. I could be in a group of people none of whom really likes me, okay? It's not out of possible existence, okay? I might be very unlucky or people might misunderstand me, but it is possible. The level above, the second D, delusions, might also be related to things that are completely or partially, uh, significantly, however, detached from reality. And in fact, within delusion here, we should also talk about hallucinations, okay? Hallucinations, okay? Um, as well as certain types of ideations, okay? Ideations, for instance, like paranoid ideations, okay? Paranoid ideations, etc. cetera, per persecutory, okay? Ideation, example. Here I might think, I don't know, uh, my friend John, right? My friend John doesn't like me, okay? So at this level, this might or might not be true, okay? First D, okay? D1, might or might not be true, okay? The second level, okay, my friend John not only doesn't like me, but doesn't like me because uh, he is with the FBI or CIA and it's out to get me. Again, probably not true, okay? Not completely false after all perhaps my friend john has a parallel secret life i'm going to be aware of and i start to be paranoid and has some sort of persecutory radiation he's out to get me okay a level above might be a hallucinatory level in fact within the second d you should probably have two subfields the hallucination may be not only my friend john doesn't like me doesn't like me because he's out to get me but my friend John is not even human, okay? Or he has some sort of secret power. He talks to me through the TV set, okay? Through the internet, even when the TV is off, even when the computer is off, okay? And by the way, this is a common feature that we will encounter when we talk about some psychotic presentation, okay? The level above this will be a third D, okay? Which we'll call dissociation, okay? Dissociation. All right, and at this level, let's call this D3, okay? At this level, I'm so completely detached from reality that I'm no longer able to keep it together, not just my reality, but my very sense of self, okay? I'm no longer integrated, so I am disintegrated, okay? Integrated, okay? So for instance, I might have a dissociative feature that separates part of my personality that take on different personality on their own. So I'm no longer, for instance, fluctuating between, I don't know, the uh, David as a parent, the David as a psychologist, the David as a researcher, and then maybe the funny David with my friends. Well, all that fun with them, uh, or the David who cracks jokes. That might or might not be fun, uh, or the David who is into music or arts, okay? 
Each day they will take on a different personality and essence, you could say, from an ontological perspective. There are separate David, okay? And with these associative features, I might actually have a problem connecting the dots. So I might have a five-year-old David that manifests itself when I'm under a specific stress, if I'm triggered by some trauma that occurred in the past. And when I'm dead, I behave in a completely different way, okay? And then that switches and I become the adult David that has everything uh, in control and maybe my age varies as well, my character changes as well, my traits change as well. So to give an example, let's use this uh, uh, piece of paper, the paper sheet, and let's see how this manifests itself, okay? So let's assume that this is my life, okay? All the complexity in my life. And again, I use this example a thousand times. I might have used that already this semester, so bear with me if I did, you know, old age and Alzheimer of the dementia, as, as I mentioned earlier. So I might have certain distortion because I was hurt a lot in life. So if this is my life, I start to have a little bit of a dent here. Okay, just a little bit of you know a problem, kind of a an open emotional wound. Okay, nothing major, but event after event, experience after experience, I start to think that everybody doesn't really like me. Okay, and maybe a little more, everybody hates me. Okay, again, it could be possible, quite unlikely, but this starts to be a more. Now, at this level, with support and love and care, people that care about me might actually help me, if not completely fix the, the problem, at least put a little patch, right? Maybe I could use this physically, give an example, I might use a, a little tape here. And yeah, the wound is still there. You know, I might not be able to completely forget what happened to me, the way I was treated, but I might be able to forgive, which is essential in psychological treatment, forgive oneself and others, okay? So yes, the, the dent, so to speak, is still there, okay? But at least it will not progress further. And then another major uh, traumatic event might happen and will bump me from level one to level two. So at this point, this continues, and yes, maybe this is slightly different than this side here, but if I keep pulling, eventually I have an even bigger dent. And at this point, my sense of self starts to be really, really in imbalance, okay? Start to be very, uh, very much disconnecting, okay? So I can no longer keep it together. I might start to have paranoid deviation. I might start to see and perceive things that are no longer there. And again, if I am lucky enough and also uh, brave enough to ask for help and I receive the help that I need, then I might be able to, you know, fix the problem partially again. Maybe the wound will be bigger now, okay? And I really don't like necessarily statements such as what doesn't, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger because life is not only about becoming stronger, but also becoming more uh, pure and consistent with yourself, more empathetic and more profound, not just strong, not just physical strength, not just resilience. Although that's an uh, important component. So at this point, my life is definitely scarred by this. And yet again, this can also be an opportunity for growth. Uh, one example that I, that I mention often is the Japanese tradition of uh, utilizing um, gold to uh, reassemble broken pieces of a vase or a glass that have been shattered and the, the vest can, can take on a new life, a new aesthetic life, thanks to the gold or golden leaf. So this is an example. Your life uh, is a symbol of what you went through, but also a reminder of all the things you were able to face and your uh, how brave you were. Okay? And then I might have another uh, traumatic event or another extreme trigger. And this point, this opens up again to the point that I can no longer keep it together, okay? Level three is to dissociate multiple parts of myself. And from time to time, if for a brief period of time, I can still see myself as part of the same puzzle, but many times I cannot keep this together. So this is just a metaphor that uh, will help us understand things such as uh, DID, for instance, dissociative identity disorder, the former multiple personality disorder, and how important it is to be integrated um, in, in the context of psychological um, um, recovery. So the next slide talks about personality disorders. 
Uh, and again, it's a bit controversial to talk about this sort of personality because this might give the impression that there are certain personalities that are good and personalities that are bad, or there are personalities that's preferable, more socially uh, good, more morally good, <laughs> better overall, and others that are really poor and bad. So uh, we had to discuss this in depth. We had a brief uh, encounter with the concept of norm from a statistical and epistemological perspective. But let's see how this uh, plays into psychopathology. And uh, we will talk more about personality as well and the way we interpret personality, for instance, in personality testing in psychology. We will talk about things such as the Myers-Briggs test, for instance, or even better, the big five personality tests, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and there are some overlap with things that we just mentioned earlier in regard to mood disorders and depression and bipolar. So for instance, um, you might be familiar with borderline personality disorders and borderline very often has been referred to as the little sibling of bipolar disorder in the sense they both experience these ups and downs, this wave-like mood fluctuation. So there's some evidence of the fact that this could be a cognitive shortcut to related to this problems and yet there's a very different psychological as well as neurological presentation between that aside from that different categorization with a borderline personality disorder we talk about personality disorders versus bipolar we talk about mood disorders and yet again mood disorders in the dsm 5 tr uh, have also been recategorized so there's also uh, an element of, of uh, taxology and taxonomy in the way we interpret that so in any case, you find in yellow, the odd eccentric cluster, cluster A, in red, B, the dramatic, unpredictable cluster, and in blue, C, the anxious, fearful cluster. So cluster A personality disorder in yellow includes paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, schizotypal personality disorder. Cluster B personality disorder in red includes antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder. And finally, in blue, the anxious fearful includes avoidant personality disorders, dependent personality disorders, and obsessive compulsive personality disorders. Now, a, a way that I uh, try to remember then, or try to remember then when I was studying uh, personality source is by using some uh, geometric symbols. Symbols, again, as cognitive shortcuts, we could say. Uh, with everything in, in psychology and psychiatry, uh, there's a lot of uh, memorization processes that I involve. So anything you can do to simplify that, it will be probably optimal. So uh, just to use the same colors as you have in your slide, but for the, for the yellow one, I'm going to use green because it's hard to see the yellow on the on the uh, whiteboard. The first thing is to keep in mind that uh, cluster A is gonna be odd and eccentric. So eccentric as in something that uh, comes out like a, like a spear or an arrow, okay? Something that uh, it's making a point, it comes out. So the first one, cluster A, is a triangle, okay? So that's how you remember the first one. So A, because it's odd and eccentric, this, this, this coming out this, this uh, uh, separation schizotypal, for instance, that comes out at you, okay? So cluster A personality disorder is all excited, it comes out to you, okay? In yellow, in, in the image that I gave you. Then we can do uh, red, and in red, I usually do a uh, square, okay? And the square is gonna represent a border, like a house, right? So B, because in the B, in the, in the so to speak, the uh, dramatic, this unpredictable characterization of uh, cluster B, borderline is the one that very often is quoted, cited the most in, in pop psychology. So you refer to this as the B and the square. Okay? And finally, to use the same color, we use the blue one. The last one, cluster C, okay? This is a circle, okay? And that's really perfect because it includes the all of obsessive compulsive disorder. So is that is the is the disorder, the personality disorder that creates anxiety, the anxious fearful. So again, triangle, square, circle as a way to remember cluster one, two, three, or cluster A, B, C uh, of personality disorders. Uh, something else I'd like to mention is that uh, 
in diagnostics, we should use cluster A, B, and C. You might find some text that use one, two, three, and uh, this will also be important because when we talk about personality, we'll talk about types of personality as well, okay? So especially when we'll encounter a certain uh, discussion on type A personality, right? Or type B personality, as opposed to personality A, B, C, and D, that's the fourth model, okay? Personality cluster for personality disorders, okay? And those are all different ways to understand personality. But based on the theoretical method that you use, you will have different type of clusters and groups. So internal personality disorders, according to the DSM, A, B, C, or A, B, O in this context, is the one that usually uh, is um, taught to, to students. So this is another way to uh, uh, summarize these uh, personality uh, disorders within the DSM. And of course, you can you don't really have to write anything inside the, the geometric shape. I wrote this big A, B, O, because A is a cluster A, but again, the A is the, the thing that it's almost like anti, it comes out, right? So whether you think about, uh, you know, the schizotypal, right? This separation, that's schizo in, in Greek, right? It's really the other center comes out. So it's an A that punctures, right? For the, the square one, the dramatic, it's the B, and for the uh, blue is the O, but you could also simply write in A, B, C. So to represent cluster A, the triangle, cluster B, the square, and cluster C, or O, really, the, the circle. So again, this is just one way to categorize them. And in the next slide, we see another way to, to interpret that. Now, the, the disorders will have to be the same because otherwise we'll have uh, inconsistency in the diagnostic framework. But this is just a little bit of a, a simplified version of, um, of understanding them. So uh, the definition here is a group of disorder characterized by rigid maladaptive traits that cause great distress or an inability to get along with others. Now, there is a social dimension to this, of course, because this Adaptive versus a maladaptive component is also a question of social, sociocultural judgment. So people might look a certain way in certain cultural framework or geocultural spaces and might present in some different way. It's also interesting to see some connection, uh, for instance, in the dating scene, how certain personality traits seem to be more likely to uh, engage in romantic relationship with individuals of another personality trait. So see a lot, for instance, of uh, uh, female um, subjects uh, diagnosed with borderline personality disorders very often in uh, conjunction in romantic relationship with uh, male individuals with narcissistic personality disorders. Now, we don't want to make any causal claim in this sense. But there is something to be said in a statistical um, level of the fact that certain personality traits might attract more or less either opposite or juxtaposed personality traits in the opposite group, which is really interesting in terms of how we understand ourselves in connection to the other person. Okay, So uh, whether we're talking about something eccentric that comes out, something that's emotional, something that is anxious, we should always think of it in the context of the social interaction of the disorders, right? Now, if if one uh, one were to give you some example, okay, think about I don't know antisocial personality disorder (ASPD), right? How can we define that? It's antisocial, anti-society. Uh, is it something that it is, is uh, I don't know um, correlated to crime, for instance? Well, the definition itself is simply. An individual that has a low level or a, a partial lack of, of conscience. Now, we talk about psychology of consciousness, but something that is more uh, impulsive, less that has less veto power, that might be manipulative toward others. And very often, ASPD is, at least in a popular description, synonymous with psychopathology in terms of psychopath or sociopathic behavior. Okay. Now, that's true that there is some sort of um, connection here with some criminal delinquent activity, but this is also part of what is displayed on, 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 on social media, on TV, et cetera, okay? Very often charming, very often giving you a, a very good impression, but 
but um, somewhat um, less prone to manifest the truth that they cheat their way through life, right? And it might be less sensitive, they might be blind to sign of disgust in other people, okay? And this is just an example. Well, what could be the cause? You know, um, can be connected to childhood experiences, adverse childhood experiences, right? Um, ACEs or ACEs, uh, such as uh, emotional neglect or deprivation, abuse, and from a neurological perspective, kind of under arousal of the brain, right? And 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 based on these experiences, they might be more likely to represent the same patterns in adult life. All right, since we talk about anxiety, let's spend a few uh, seconds on anxiety disorders. Uh, when stress seems greatly out of proportion to the situation at hand, usually accompanied by some form of avoidance. We talk about Freud and this projection or defense mechanism. Avoidance can also be interpreted in a similar uh, cognitive pattern, right? Because you're trying to either face something and you're not able, and so you can either um, run away, and this is connection with a fight and flight response, especially when we talk about stress. Now, in practice, there are three main types of generalized anxiety disorder, GAD, although there is a difference between the DSM-4 and 5. Now, for GAD, um, uh, duration of at least six months of chronic, unrealistic, or excessive anxiety. Now, fun fact is that when they were trying to review uh, and revise the DSM, uh, they th there was a discussion between anxiety and, and obsession, a GAD and OCD, and they came up with the acronym GOD, and then they realized that it spelled out God, and so they decided not to use that and go back to GAD. It's kind of an interesting thing on uh, the way the, the research group that worked on the DSM came out with the with a possible new acronym. Uh, so the second type, panic disorder with or without agoraphobia. Uh, agora is Greek for this piazza, this big square, okay? So it has a social dimension. This is not social phobia, but it's interaction with, with others, right? Not to be confused with arachnophobia, okay? The fear of spiders, right? And then phobia, basic phobia in general. Now, um, what what can we say about, about anxiety disorder? Well, we could also think about the cause, right, in terms of what can we face? Are we prepared to face consequences? There are incongruence between our expectations of life, okay? So if you think about congruence, we are congruent, we have this ideal self-image that is true to self. If you're incongruent, there's a separation between our ideal self, our self-image, and our true self, right? So. Uh, this is this is a kind of holistic perspective. Now you do have a, a cognitive um, understanding of cause. So for instance, when you have those cognitive distortions we just mentioned, you have this sort of thinking causing people to either uh, magnify or minimize problems um, uh, or, or over time okay, in a sequential matter. You might have a behavioristic uh, explanation. We talked about that in conditioning, right? So condition emotional response and generalized to new situation. And you have anxiety reduction hypothesis when reward of immediate relief from anxiety perpetuates self-defeating avoidance behavior. Think about what we what we discuss in terms of learned uh, helplessness, right? And of course, Freud will see that as as defense mechanisms, it's habitual or unconscious psychological processes that are designed to reduce anxiety. And so you can have multiple ways to in interpret that, like. You may have denial, you may have reaction formation or repression. Now, in the first case, the denial is the more, it's not instinctual, the most primitive, right? You deny reality uh, and, and you are in, in a state of uh, shock or suspension. We will talk about that when we will um, discuss the grief and loss, uh, the process, the, the five stages of grief or the seven stage of grief and the, and the work by uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross toward the end of the semester. Um, for repression, uh, this occurs when painful memories or anxieties are held out of our awareness. So there's something that we're not fully aware of, and this has to do with, with our subconscious self, okay, or unconscious self. And then reaction formation, impulses are repressed, and the opposite behavior is exaggerated, right? So this is kind of a classical uh, Freudian um, analysis. It's not just that. If, if one day you will have the chance to study more uh, uh, in-depth psychoanalysis, you can also see that there are things such as projections. So it, when, once own feelings uh, or, or acceptable things, traits, et cetera, are seen in others, right? 
um, and exaggerating them in others, pointing out to others this lowers anxiety or rationalization, which is the justification of personal actions by giving quote unquote rational but false reason about them. So this is just an example. All right, so let's continue with panic disorders, right? Without agoraphobia, right? A chronic state of anxiety with brief moments of sudden, intense, and unexpected panic, panic attacks. So what are panic attacks? It feels like one is having a heart attack, is going to die, or is going insane. Now, keep in mind that the term insane is, at least in the U.S., in the, uh, American English, utilized only in legal um, context, okay? Although the word itself means unhealthy in Latin. It does not have any negative connotation. Um, symptoms include vertigo, chest pain, choking, fear of losing control. And they have panic disorders with agoraphobia, panic attacks, and sudden anxiety still occur, but this time, of course, as it implies with agoraphobia. The image that I use here is the uh, Greek god Pan, or Pan, that give birth to, uh, or give rise to the word panic, okay, is the, this god of, you know, nature, woods, and forests, uh, this kind of animalesque, uh, and again, you could say subconscious or perhaps pre-conscious notion um, it's also connected to things such as pan as in omnicomprehensive, same thing, for instance, as uh, pan-Slavism or pan-Germanism, pan-Latinism, this, this historical uh, political context. In pan-Slavism, for instance, the, the political movements that want to unite all Slavs into one geocultural political entity, Slavs from all the way from Siberia all down to Macedonia and Bosnia and the Czech Republic. Uh, Poland, et cetera, et cetera. Pan Slav, Pan German is the same thing, you know, all Germanic people. So the Germans, the Danes, the Swedes, the um, Anglo Saxon words, North America, especially um, Canada and the United States, all Germans, all Germanic, so Pan German. So panic disorders as refer to the God Pan, okay? This, this impulse, this not rationalized uh, nature, occult force, so to speak. That's where the word comes from. Let's continue with phobias, which could also be translated simply as fears, right? So specific phobias, irrational, persistent fears, anxiety and avoidance that focus on specific objects, activities, or situations. People with phobias realize that their fears are unreasonable and excessive, but they cannot control them. Again, this is a separation between what we know intellectually to be true, and yet we cannot act upon it in a rational, balanced way. Social phobia, as the name implies, intense, irrational fear of being observed, evaluated, humiliated, or embarrassed by others, shyness, eating, or speaking in public, which again brings us to the conversation of, is this all a diagnosis? Aren't we all experienced to some extent social phobia, right? For instance, aren't we all experiencing some level of fear of being observed, for instance, when we are completing a test, okay, or when we are going to a big event, we might be afraid of having a stain on our shirt, as an example before. So to some extent, uh, we have to keep this in mind. From a diagnostic standpoint, psychological disorders also mean that they have to be observed over time, okay, and with specific intensity. They have to make a dent in our everyday uh, life activities, okay? Major disturbances in emotions, such as depression or mania, depressive disorders, sadness or despondency are prolonged, exaggerated, or unreasonable. Bipolar disorder involve both depression and mania or hypomania. So this is going from phobias to mood disorder. We mentioned a little bit uh, depression and, uh, and uh, bipolar, but I want to mention this again in this slide because that is one of the... Um, problematic um, attitude that someone see in the way the DSM, the US version of the DSM views mood. What is actually mood? Okay? So again, depression is unipolar really and, bi and bipolar depression or just bipolar involving both an up and down. Now here I mentioned depressive disorder, sadness or despondency are prolonged, exaggerated and unreasonable. Please keep in mind that depression has also very significant physiological components. It's not just about it's not just about sadness. Okay, there is a physical physiological component to it as well. Mentioning SAD, seasonal affective disorder, depression that only occurs fall during fall and winter may be related to reduced exposure to sunlight and 
in therapeutic terms, heliotherapy or phototherapy are recommended, so light therapy. This is also somewhat um, problematic because uh, there is uh, solid scientific evidence on the role of uh, sun exposure to, to the way uh, uh, depression is uh, modulated and also the fact that the vitamin D is also connected to uh, biochemical components in the brain. And from a more social psychology component, this also might uh, corroborate the rationale behind higher, late, higher rates of depressive states and even higher rates of suicidality in geocultural areas that are otherwise viewed as very nurturing, very positive, good lifestyle. Think about uh, Scandinavia, for instance, where on a social level, the the socioeconomic, social, uh, political factors seem to be quite optimal, and yet you still uh, see a lot of high or, or a lot of higher, on average, rates of depressive state and suicidality, which might have to do with uh, different exposure to sun, especially fall and winter, or if you're close to the uh, the North Pole, um, you the the, the long uh, six months or so. Um, uh, lack of exposure to sun. All right, lasting strains of mood or emotion and sometimes with psychotic features, as we mentioned before, hallucination and delusions. Um, um, when we think about uh, mania, uh, we think about an excited, hyperactive, energetic, grandiose behavior and the bipolar two disorders identifies a person which is mainly sad has one or more hypomanic episode, mild mania, versus the bipolar one, extreme mania, and deep repression, one type of manic depressive illness, the other one being the two. So again, uh, please keep in mind that we're not, we're not claiming that bipolar two is the milder version of bipolar one or the shorter or a simpler version of bipolar one, but one is uh, identify as full mania and the other one with hypomania. We don't really use the term hypermania. We might say extreme mania or full mania. Okay, stress and dissociative disorders. We mentioned this a brief uh, earlier. Acute stress disorders, psychological disturbance lasting up from to one month following stresses from a traumatic event. PTSD or post traumatic stress disorder, which lasts more than one month after a traumatic event has occurred may last for years and it's typically associated with combat and violent crimes for instance rape assault dissociative amnesia think about what we said about dissociation in general so the dissociative feature and you already know what amnesia is we talked about that in week five inability to recall one's name address or past biographical memories memory loss is partial or complete for personal information the associated food, so sudden um, travel away from home and confusion about personal identity. Okay, so there's a partial element here. Now, the full diagnosis of DID, dissociative identity disorder, former MPD or multiple personality disorder. In this case, the person has two or more distinct separate identities or personal traits. It often begins with horrific childhood experiences, again, abuse, molestation, etc. Therapy often makes use of hypnosis. Um, uh, and with hypnosis, I want to mention this, that with DID, the big uh, debate within um, psychotherapy is how much should we, for lack of a better term, quote unquote, believe the person? Are we adding fuel to the fire if we address the person with their temporary identity? Okay, and The person might identify as a five-year-old child, it's probably the fact that they are, I don't know, 42-year-old or something like that. Are we contributing to the dissociation? Should we put a blockade? Should we not play games to use a kind of a harsh language here? And the researchers are somewhat uh, conflicted about that simply because of the time frame. So for instance, uh, one of the things that, that you notice is that you might quote unquote pick your battles in a short temporary state, in acute setting, for instance, in patient psychiatry unit. But if you do not help the patient face their identity and you just go with it, the long-lasting effects are going to be much more complicated, much more detrimental to the health of the person. Eventually, the person will have to learn to reincorporate this shattered identity and just playing that 
with these self-made up identities will not be healthy for the person. And this is, an, again, an example of what we said earlier about the importance of emotions, but also not relying only on personal emotional component, because they themselves will represent an outcome of the trauma encounter, not a solution. Let's continue. So myoform versus psychosomatic disorders. We mentioned soma, Greek for body, okay, or physical body, so to speak, in, in juxtaposition to physis, right, nature. Hypochondriasis or hypochondria in parenthesis, slightly different in terms of the diagnostic uh, uh, focus. In this case, the person is preoccupied with fears of having a serious illness or disease. Think of preoccupied as in fearful, perhaps, anxious, okay, ruminating even, but also occupied beforehand. Preoccupation means occupation before something happens. And you might not know whether it's something will happen or not. So there is an element of distortion. You are afraid of something that might not happen at all. Okay. Fear of having a serious illness or disease, despite the fact that you might be just fine. So you interpret normal sensations and body signs as a proof that they have a terrible disease. To be um, sure here, no physical disorder can be found. Okay. You're just afraid of something happening here. And I should also mention that in this context, that are certain things that might be culturally uh, constructed, okay? Um, and um, there, there's more to it. And um, the example I mentioned earlier is uh, some of the, the research that has to do with um, pseudo patients and patients being forced to be locked uh, in, um, even if they were uh, not. Uh, really psychiatric patients that did not suffer from a real um, psychiatric disorder. Now, this was the, there are many examples, but the most famous one, at least the most famous one in the, in the, in the United States is the study by, by David Rosenhan, the, the Rosenhan experiment. Um, he, he worked at um, Stanford, Stanford University. And um, it was an experiment, you know, that, that he conducted to determine whether uh, psychiatry was a legit field, whether the psychiatric diagnosis were actually uh, w was actually true or not. So, uh, well, th there were two parts of of this this study, and it's interesting that the first part, pretty much, there were patients that were really not true uh, patients, and and they they pretended to have hallucinations and 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 um, and some dissociative feature, but in any case, they they, they faked that to try to get admitted to um, certain hospitals in the U.S. I think there were 10 or 12, 12, I think, psychiatric hospitals in the U.S. And they were all admitted. They were all diagnosed with psychiatric disorders, although they were diagnosed with different type of disorders, right? Now, the interesting thing in this experiment is that these, these patients, these pseudo-psychiatric patients, they just acted normally right after admission, okay? And they told staff in the hospital that they were not experiencing any other hallucination, not other disorder. The interesting is that, that all the patients were forced to admit to having a mental illness and had to take antipsychotic medication as a condition for the release, despite the fact they did not have anything, right? Now, the interesting thing is, I mean, interesting, it's very concerning thing is that not only they were forced to take medications, but or the fact they were, quote unquote, completely normal, quote unquote, because of the discussion earlier about statistics. But they were fully normal, as in not experiencing any psychological issue whatsoever. They spent about 20 days, 19 days on average, I think. And all but one person were diagnosed with schizophrenia in remission before the release. So the interesting thing is that once you label someone with a problem, even if they think of the problem as no longer existing, it's just in remission. Now, notice that this is part of the issue with psychiatric as part of medicine, because in no other sub-branch of medicine, you will claim that. Perhaps uh, an exception to the rule might be within um, oncology and cancer treatment. You might say cancer in remission, but otherwise, for the most part, let's say if you have, a, I don't know, an um, injury on your knee and you repaired and recovered, that you no longer had the injury, okay? Or even more basic things, once you have, I don't know, a... Um, common cold and you no longer have a cold, you don't spend the rest of the year calling yourself someone with a cold in remission. And yet in psychiatry, this happens all the time. Okay? 
So the, the interesting thing is that eventually and within the studies, uh, they, the, the researchers told the, all these hospitals that they were just pseudo patients, but the second part was even more interesting, more intriguing. So they said that they, they, uh, they, um, the, 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 the hospital and study administration, um, they challenged the, the researcher and the researcher said, brace yourself. I will send you more fake patient, more pseudo patients. Okay. So that I'll, 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 I'll see how good you are in separating the real patients from the false ones. Okay. So the challenge was this kind of dual challenge. Uh, David Rosenhan telling the hospital, let's see how good you are in your diagnosis and the hospital replying, uh, we, uh, br bring it on. Um, we, are, we are ready. Just send our to the patients to see if, 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 how how good we are. We are able to detect the fake ones from the real ones. So Rosenhan, nevertheless, uh, needless to say, agreed. And 41 out of 193 new patients were identified as potential pseudo patients, with 19 of these receiving suspicion from at least one psychiatrist and one of the staff members. The most interesting thing is that Rosenhan did not send any fake patient at all to the hospitals, okay? So this was really, really problematic because it really presented this, um, this um, how can I say this, uh, fake um, interpretation of psychiatric diagnostics. And by fake, I don't really mean to say that they were, um, how can I say this, they, 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 they were challenging all psychiatry as a field necessarily, uh, but the diagnostic framework, the, you could say that it's a very similar thing uh, between, how can I say this, challenging diagnostic framework, the way the diagnosis is uh, utilized and uh, the connection with, you know, forced medication, forced uh, uh, admission in a locked unit, the, the, this attitude can be challenged in the same context as the peer review process in general, because keep in mind, we're not talking about just one hospital, one single psychiatrist, but throughout the U.S., okay, so it's a really uh, relevant uh, percentage, I would say, um, and it's very similar to other uh, issues uh, within social sciences as well, and again, psychiatry and psychology are always in at, at the intersection between natural sciences, hard sciences, and social science, because of course, as it implies, they involve mind and body. Um, so to question uh, the scientific um, environment, the, 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 the peer-reviewed system, the, the Rosenheim experiment is probably one of the most famous one. More recently, actually, uh, if you're interested in this, the, the grievance studies affair was also uh, very relevant to shed light on very problematic aspects of academia. I mentioned last week the issue with the non-replicability of psychological studies and how we should always take that in the grain of salt. But I mentioned multiple times how careful we should be in citing studies that have been published too recently. The issue was always, please do not cite studies that are too old because we have new research coming out. And so the research you found maybe 20 years ago are no longer valid. But now probably for the very first time in modern Western history, we find the opposite problem. The more recent studies seem to be completely anti-scientific. So uh, studies that are just made up and have no real epistemological or empirical validity whatsoever. Uh, now, the grievance studies affair um, was a study, a, 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 well, depending who you ask, it can be either viewed as a hoax or as a solid research that really nailed it to the, the, the most negative outcome. It was a publication really of bogus academic papers. The authors were Peter Bogosian, James Lindsay, and Helen uh, Pluckrose. And, um, and they were really, they were not really targeting uh, academia in general, uh, but exposing really poor science in specific categories of um, sociology and related fields. So if you are interested in the grievance study affair, it, it's really, really an, an interesting ways that uh, uh, science can really learn from within how um, 
post uh, I mean they, they use many many terms like post uh, modernist post colonial theories uh critical race theory um, intersectionality etc um are for lack of a better term in need of much more solid scientific evidence I will not say anything further about the grievance studies affair I will post a link if you are interested uh but it's very similar to what uh, the discussion we just had um about um the the research by the rooms and it was about so uh again going back to what we said at the beginning of this um lecture uh please uh try not to lose faith and I use faith with a grain of salt here okay I'm used that with 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 thinking about what the term means um in toward academia toward science to a higher education but also be ready to ask questions any true scientist welcomes questions does not shy away for very complex investigation that's precise way yet again I really encourage you to interact with me uh, via email or via comments etc I'm really interested in having your perspective all right so to to go back to to what we said earlier about uh no physical disorder can be found and and the fact that there is a separation between observation scientific understanding diagnosis prognosis and treatment let's continue somatization disorder the person expresses anxiety through numerous physical complaints many doctors and by that I mean physicians clinicians etc are consulted by no organic or physical causes are found which again does not mean that either the disorder is not there but simply there is no specific scientific explanation available I'm using the term yet okay pain disorders pain that has no identifiable organic physical cause and appears to have a psychological origin this is also problematic because very often within medicine psychological psychosomatic is used to say well you're not really suffering really there's really no true medical issue you just have a psychological interpretation now sometimes this is true it matches reality it has to do with what the the, the triple d model so with distortions with some level of of delusional component dissociative feature but sometimes we cannot really interpret that fully a classical example would be fibromyalgia another one that I mentioned here would be conversion disorder which very often is is considered um as the patient subconsciously or half consciously lying to the uh, clinician severe emotional conflicts are quote-unquote converted into physical symptoms or a physical uh, disability caused by anxiety or emotional distress but not by physical causes now the interesting thing is that uh related to this although not synonymous it's also Cotard syndrome and uh, I had the, the the chance to work with uh, several patients affected by Cotard syndrome and one of the the complaints that it had was that their body was rotting from inside they said that their body was empty they just had this shell with no functioning organs or no organs at all it's quite a fact that they were able to eat they were able to use the bathroom so the, their urination was fine their, you know they were able to, the, the defecation was also fine uh we were able to monitor their weight or BMI etc and they were claiming that their body was empty which is a really interesting presentation from a clinical standpoint other interesting thing uh, glove anesthesia loss of sensitivity in areas of skin normally covered by a glove and there is some um, research indication that there might be some connection with things such as the quote-unquote uh, white coat syndrome perhaps some level of anxiety some level of somatoforming or psychosomatized elements there as well um, more research is needed now to continue with psychosis just because I want to give you a more detailed definition again keep in mind this is a summary psychosis uh, loss of contact with reality marked by hallucinations delusions disturbed thoughts and emotion and personality disorganization if you are disorganized you are not organized you don't have an organic component you're not um, fully integrated we could say organic psychosis nothing to do with uh organic either in the context of chemistry or uh the locally source uh food uh, movement okay psychosis caused by brain injury or disease dementia we already mentioned that before most common organic psychosis serious mental impairment in old age caused by brain deterioration known as senility at times 
uh, from the Latin. And then Alzheimer's disease, we already mentioned that before, so I'm not gonna uh, spend, uh, spend too much time here. Delusional disorder marked by a uh, presence uh, of deeply held false beliefs, delusions, usually involving the delusion of grandeur, persecution, or jealousy. There might be also um, um, a sexual component to, the, to this uh, as well. Now, interesting is that delusion in other um, language families, like as the Italic families, are called uh, illusion. Okay, so your delusional, your illusional, use your illusion. It was a very uh, uh, famous album by Guns N' Roses. So it's interesting how uh, the, this etymology kind of are, are connected. Paranoid psychosis, most common delusional disorders, centers on delusions of persecution. Okay, so again, we cannot spend too much time here, but there are many forms that are there. There's jealousy, this persecution, grandiose, erotomanic, somatic, etc., etc., etc. All right, um, and um, these are not the only psychotic symptoms. You might have inappropriate, incongruent emotion, flat affect, personality, disintegration, apathy, withdrawal, uh, breaking on personal habits, even, even problems with selective attention. Schizophrenia, very often uh, referred to as the cancer of uh, psychiatric disorders. Uh, you have multiple subtypes. And again, there are some differences between the different version of the DSM and some discrepancy between the DSM and the ICD. But in, you know, in short, disorganized schizophrenia, incoherence, grossly disorganized behavior, bizarre thinking, and a flat or grossly inappropriate emotions. Catatonic schizophrenia, marked by stupor, where victim may also hold the same position for hours or days, and it's also unresponsive, almost like a trapped in one's body. Not in the sense of uh, locked in syndrome, nothing to do with that, but just in the way that it presents itself, okay? Paranoid schizophrenia, preoccupation with illusion, grandeur, or persecution, also involves association that are related to a single theme, especially grandeur or persecution. Undifferentiated schizophrenia, any type of schizophrenia that does not have paranoid, catatonic, or organized features or symptoms. Okay, now, um, what causes it? Again, let me keep this in mind, uh, give you an example that when we think about the genetic uh, background, the genetic relatedness, okay, in schizophrenia, even if you have 100% of genetic relatedness, and this will be in twin studies an identical twin, the risk of developing schizophrenia never, ever reaches 50%, okay? All studies are consistent in the sense the top is 48, 48.2%, which simply means that doesn't matter how much of genetic makeup you have, if all you know the the the, the necessary features for a higher level of genetic relatedness for schizophrenia, you still don't know whether your offspring will also have schizophrenia in more than fifty percent of the cases. Okay, so you don't know in more than fifty percent of the cases. The identical twin shows that the risk up to forty percent and goes down from that. Okay, so if your offspring are two patients, okay. 40%. If you have another twin fraternal this time, not identical twin, so the genetic relatedness is 50%. So it's 100% if it's identical for obvious reason, right? Goes down to 50%, that goes down to 70%. Okay. So and it goes really down, you know, pretty much through the, the family category. If you just have a sibling, 50% goes up to 9%, and then goes down to, I think, 4.1 or 4.2% if your nephew or niece. 2% spouse and 1% and uh, or less in the general uh, uh, population. So keep in mind that whatever happens to you, genetically speaking, life is an open door. Okay? Do not let that uh, determine um, your future in that sense. Okay, This doesn't mean that there is a solid uh, understanding of um, why we need to study genetic more within um psychology disorder, psychiatry disorder, in medicine in general, but this should not determine in itself what you think about your future from this from this standpoint. So what, what other causes are within schizophrenia, just because we mentioned that? Well, there are multiple hypotheses. The dopamine hypothesis, there's too much dopamine signaling or the dopamine receptor are oversensitive. There may be um, psychological trauma, like usually referred to as shock or injury. There might be uh, there might be there for certainly other non-genetic component like family environment disturbed 
family environment, some deviant communication patterns, some uh, components that are also partially her heredity based, but also connected to the stress vulnerability hypothesis that we already encountered. Um, maybe some, maybe just because the percentages are different, neurodevelopmental factors like some abnormality in the way neurons prune, the pruning of neurons, some decreased functioning of, of uh, GABA, gamma butyric acid interneurons in the cortex, perhaps some smaller cell bodies in neurons. So there's no one single uh, case, okay? Neurons are no one single cause uh, for schizophrenia, okay? And how can we study that? Well, we can have a CT scan, okay? And the CT scan usually shows schizophrenic brains as having wider surface fissures. We can have the you know the MRI scan that uh, show that usually in the, the schizophrenic brains. And again, and using this in, in parentheses, schizophrenic brains, brains of people affected by schizophrenia. Okay, they have enlarged ventricles. We may have uh, things such as what would be a good example, uh, PET scan, positron emission tomography, that shows usually that there's a low or abnormal low activity in the frontal lobes. So there, there's a variety of ways uh, to study that as well. Okay, so uh, what else can we say? Um, multiple other things, and again, I want to uh, I want to be mindful of um, of the time here. And um, one of the last thing I want to mention here is that there might be um, some of the issues that we find in the discussion of the DSM specifically, okay? So keep in mind that the first edition of DSM was published in the, in the early 50s. I believe it was the 1952, the very first edition. Um, and uh, the, the most current one, the first edition of the most current one was 2013. So quite quite a bit of um, of uh, developmental uh, uh, timeline. So in terms of what I just want you to keep in mind to conclude this part of our lecture is that some of the major differences between the previous versions, okay, especially from DSM-3 on until the, the fourth edition TR and the current DSM-5 is the access, the multi-axial, uh, component that was pretty much, um, if not completely disregarded, reframed. So you, you have axis one through three that became psychiatric and medical diagnosis, axis four, psychosocial and contextual factors that corresponds to the ICD 10 Z codes, and then the fifth, axis five, disability. So axis one, clinical disorders, axis two, developmental disorder and personality disorders, axis three, general medical conditions became psychiatric and medical diagnosis. Axis four, psychosocial and environmental problems became psychosocial and contextual factors. And axis five, global assessment of functioning scale, the GAF scale, became disability. Now, this is something interesting because uh, it's not true that this is completely disregarded in practice, okay? Uh, now, for instance, um, when uh, when performing these uh, uh, diagnostic interviews in a context of patient psychiatric unit, you might find multiple interviews, okay? And the multi-axial uh, approach is still uh, very much uh, used, okay? But um, it's important to understand that the reason for the, the change was this attempt to find more um, of a neurological, neuroscientific basis for it, okay? And again, um, the diagnostic features have to do with everything we said earlier about the, the DSM. Um, and when we talk more about um, personality, uh, we will see that as part of the diagnostic features, you have a long body of psychological research with personality tests. I mentioned the big five, I mentioned the Myers-Briggs, um, inventories are also very important. For instance, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, the MMPI, okay? And, you know, some tests at the intersection between standard, I would say, psychological research and even art therapy. For instance, the Rorschach, the Inkblot test, or the thematic apperception test, the TAT. You may have some tests that are in between uh, neurology, neuroscience, and psychiatry psychology. Think about the MOCA test, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test. So 
keep in mind that it's, it's it's very very broad and and this doesn't mean touch upon things such as intelligence tests iq tests um that assess mental ability the vexler scales the, the adult intelligence scales the intelligence for, for children and preschool primary scale children uh, or the stanford binet for instance right and uh and other assessment that has to do more with behavior uh, as well as self-observation because uh, in the pyramid of evidence, everything plays a role, okay? Um, so I want to mention this because there's a lot of uh, psychological assessment methods. So you have diagnostic, clinical interviews, structured interviews, you have psychological tests, and, and by then, I also mean projective tests, intelligent tests, as well as some level of um, uh, pain or stress measures, Likert scales, you have direct observation and sub observation and of course you have all the uh, neurologically informed um uh, studies so brain imaging neurotransmitters assessment or psychological assessment i mentioned that before when i when i showed the clinical neuropsychology uh pocket handbook for assessment of the the, the american psychology association the one that was um published or rather edited by uh parson and hamica um, and um, you have the psychophysiological assessment, which is really a, a hybrid because it measures electrical activity in the autonomic nervous system, such as skin conductance, uh, or, or in the central nervous system, for instance, with EEG. Okay, so all of this inform our knowledge. You have you also have uh, things that are by definition medically in general, because we talk about comorbidities, the fact that certain disorders are more likely to present themselves in connection with other uh, medical or other psychiatric problems so you have psychophysiological assessment and understanding how the stress response might play a role in anxiety or depression extremely important think of uh, things that just you know knowing how the heart of a person is doing electrocardiogram ekg um, and and life assessment and of course some cultural bias assessment is also important because we need to understand that uh it's the the full understanding of psychological disorder, psychiatric disorder, and psychopathology can only be performed if we have solid scientific evidence, uh, consistent and valid um, epistemological understanding, as well as empathy and an open-minded approach to the problem. Now, th this is really just an introduction to the disorders. Uh, by no means comprehensive, but I hope I was able to give you something to, to think about um, as we move on to the uh, central part of the semester. All right, great. So this concludes uh, week seven, um, mental health disorders, diagnostics, um, um, psychological, psychiatric issues, problems, um, um, psychopathology. Uh, as I mentioned multiple times today, please, please, please keep in mind that today is a summary, in fact, a very brief summary, right? Through the history of the DSM, for instance, we went from um, less than 400 pages to over 1,000 pages and from about 100 uh, disorders to over 400 disorders uh, and different labels and some disorders that have an overlapping things and, and other things that I mentioned before, like mood disorders, recategorized and then ignored and reassessed. So uh, it's only an introduction, okay? I hope I gave you an overall understanding of psychology and uh, psychiatric disorders. We will continue on week eight, but again, this is a good time for all of you to sit back and see what direction you would like to take uh, for the remainder of the semester, especially considering uh, the midterm draft for the final uh, paper. So the midterm draft is just one page uh, that discusses your general idea of the direction you want to take, and then your final project. Um, so at the very least, you can consider an intro psychology course as a way to investigate psychology from a variety of perspectives you already encountered: philosophical, biological, neuroscientific, historical, etc. But also with today's lecture, also embark on a practical application of the course so you can incorporate what you learned this semester into your life and career. So perhaps you might also be interested in discussing and investigating further psychological disorder, clinical aspect, diagnosis, and the clinical profession associated with it.
Thank you very much for your attention. I will see you all in week eight. And please reach out to me if you have any question. I'm sure you do. It's a complex topic. And um, uh, send me uh, emails, and I'll be happy to uh, address uh, the question you might have. One other disclaimer I have to say, to clarify, uh, I'm not uh, allowed to wear multiple hats, so I cannot be both an instructor and a therapist. So I'm here to support you in any way, shape, or form. I will not be able to provide um, uh, psychological, psychotherapeutic uh, treatment or advice um, to, to any student. Uh, but I am an open book in a sense that I'm always uh, here to support your academic career and to help you untangle some of the things that might not have been clear enough in this lecture. All right, so one uh, more week, and I want to thank you all for your attention and uh, creativity, passion, and focus on this fascinating topic. Bye-bye.